Welcome to Lysianthus Forever. As many of you might know, we've been hosting uh, some Instagram live sessions for the past year plus. Those were super fun. We loved them. It was a great way for us to connect with customers and bring you a lot of educational material. But um, we sort of outgrew uh, Instagram Live, and we wanted to provide you with something even bigger, better, and um, more informative. So let's just get right into it. Again, my name is Thomas, Thomas McCurdy. I am the uh, Director of Operations here at Farmer Bailey. Uh, being a plug broker, there are a lot of moving parts to this kind of complicated business, and it's my job to just keep all those parts moving as best I can. Um, also joining us from our team today is Felicia D'Ambrosio. Felicia is our mm -hmm. Director of Customer Experience. She It was her idea to do this today, to provide you all with this incredible experience, and um, you're really grateful that she had this idea and spearheaded the whole day. So hello, Felicia. Everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, we also have Ali Dick, who is our uh, customer success manager. If you have a problem with your order or question about anything, Ali is um, the expert. She's here to help you and she's here to help all of us today. So hi, Ali. Thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. So happy to see how many people are here. So uh, you might have some questions that come up during um, this presentation today. Hopefully you do. Um, it is our goal to answer those questions in the next 90 or so minutes. Um, but if you have questions at the end of this that haven't been answered, send us an email, info at farmerbailey.com. Our whole team is standing by, ready to help. If it's a complicated cultural question, it might take us a couple days to get back to you, but rest assured, we will get back to you. Even if you're not a customer of ours, we want you to succeed with Lysianthus. We've got you. Um, at the end of our presentation today, we're going to be um, announcing a giveaway. Actually, I'm announcing it right now, I guess. Uh, we uh, are going to be sending out a survey at the end of the presentation. And if you fill that out, um, uh, one of you will be selected to receive a copy of Farmer Fa Flower Farming for Profit, a brand new book by our good friend Lenny Larkin. It's a super comprehensive, everything you need to know book about how to make money while growing flowers. Um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Bailey Hale, Farmer Bailey himself. <laughs> uh, take it away. Hey, that's me. Can you hear me? Good. All right. Um, I'm going to give you a real quick background about how I started growing flowers, my experience as a farmer, and how we formed this kind of... Uh, well, this plug business, we really didn't expect to have a plug business, but here we are, and we couldn't be happier. We love the flower farming community. We love finding new varieties. Um, I get such satisfaction of helping all of you to succeed. Um, I've been gardening since I was six. That's more than 40 years ago. Uh, my grandmother, Ardelia, um, taught me how to propagate stuff and grow roses and sow seeds. And it's just kind of in my blood. I haven't stopped really once in that entire time. Um, I did study at the University of Kentucky. I have a bachelor's of science in horticulture and a degree in opera performance, but you'll never hear me sing. Um, I had the fortune of interning at Longwood Gardens after that time that I then moved to Philadelphia. I was an award winning floral and event designer um, with some nice prizes from the Philadelphia Flower Show. And then I left Philadelphia with Thomas in 2011 to start farming. <clears throat> um, just a bit of my old design work, did a lot of really modern kind of off the wall stuff. Um, so I had the horticulture background um, to draw on. And then I also had this floral background where I learned how you use the flowers and what the flowers should look like. Um, I can thank the ASCFG for helping me connect those points. Um, so yeah, we left. Philadelphia to start farming. Initially, we were in New York State, and then we ended up um, moving to Irisburg, Vermont, in the very northeast corner. It was about 50 acres. Um, diversified flower farm, and by diverse, we do mean diverse. Uh, we had a half acre of high tunnels. That was five different high tunnels, um, one heated, five, um, four unheated, three acres of woody perennials, which unfortunately all matured the year we moved away. Um, <clears throat> and about a half acre of herbaceous perennials. So I know these plants. Um, I've done a lot of research on them. I do a lot of trial and error. I've killed many, many thousands of plants and I've learned every time I've done that. So during that time we were selling to florists 
um, one or two wedding floors, primarily in Vermont. Um, we also sold at farmers markets, and eventually we sold wholesale to New York City. That would be our sweet pea, our sweet pea crop. Um, we have some full service weddings. We had brunch events in our barn. We did floral design events. We did dinner events. We also raised beef and pork and poultry and rabbits. And we had a bakery and a sweet pea seed company. And we did a lot more than this. We tried everything and we got a little bit tired, I got to tell you. Um, here's just some flashbacks to our origin. <clears throat> um, some old farmer's market photos. This would be some of my first couple years of harvesting anything. Um, and those of us who've done this realize how exciting it is. We've had all these dreams and these plans and you finally have flowers to sell. I'm gonna say my first real success was when I had cut flower or cut lisianthus available. Um, my first success with that, I think I even grew some of these from seed one year. And uh, well, I'm happy I did and that I've fallen in love with this plant. <clears throat> There's Thomas in our herbaceous uh, perennial field. And here is the old, one of the old sweet pea tunnels. Um, you can see in the distance, actually, we have an inside and outside view of those tunnels. We had a beautiful spot in Vermont, and we loved, just loved being there. Um, again, here's our event barn. These are some of the cut sweet peas that I was selling to New York. Um, really nice quality, really well suited to the cool uh, parts of northeastern Vermont. So in 2016, really as a result of meeting all of these other flower farmers, um, we saw the need for there to be um, another vendor in this realm. We needed better access as American farmers to the same products that I was accustomed to bringing in from around the world. I used to import flowers from Holland. I would import flowers from Japan. Yet for some reason, we didn't have these varieties available to us small and medium sized growers. And I kept asking suppliers and they kept telling me no, and I don't like no. So we figured it out. I knew the seed was out there. We brought it into America. Um, my, our first growing partner was Grow and Sell and they agreed. Um, we started with Lysianthus, of course, the Roseanne series, all those really funny brown colors. Um, so we established that in 2016. Um, our mission is to inspire greatness in growers of all sizes by providing superior starter plants, extraordinary customer service, and expert educational resources. Um, some of my favorite customers' interactions are with those of you who are just starting, because you got to start somewhere, and there's just so much to learn if you don't come from a horticultural background like I did, or even if you did and you haven't focused on cut flowers. There's just a lot to this field that we are getting into. Um, similarly, if you're just a gardener, um, I won't say just a gardener, I love gardening and I recommend you start as a gardener before you start trying to commercialize this hobby. Um, you have my attention. I'm happy to help you learn crop by crop. So today we're obviously focusing on Lysianthus. Um, I will say we do offer extraordinary customer service, no thanks to me, largely because of our team. In the early days, I was trying to do this all, and I uh, definitely was nowhere near as good as um, the, the team we have in place now. Um, so you know, if you know about us, you know that about a year ago, we moved to Madeira, Portugal. Um, really, as the plug business grew, there was no reason for us to be in Vermont, where it was negative 35, negative 40 degrees sometimes. Um, honestly, the two main reasons we moved, my asthma, no longer enjoy Vermont. I was having trouble breathing all the time. Um, and also, I just wanted to garden all year long. Since I was a kid, I said I want a tropical garden, and I can do that here in Madeira, even though it's kind of a subtropical climate. So that's why we're over here. But we're back in America all the time, and we're still uh, available to serve all American growers every day. So here's just kind of an overview of what we will do today. Um, talk about why you grow Lysianthus. We're going to talk about the native environment of Lysianthus. That's where I like to start with any new flower is its native environment. We'll learn about bloom, bloom groups. We'll learn about growing from seed versus buying in plugs and what you know the benefits of both are. Um, when to order. You know, when, you want your, when you want your delivery and when you should order that. We'll go into some cultural tutorials. We'll talk about a little bit about the possibility of organic seeds and plugs. Um, it's not currently that viable, and we'll talk about why. And we'll talk a little bit about global Lysianthus production. OK, 
Okay, before we get into that, we're gonna do this fun little word cloud thing where we just wanna hear from you. It's a workhorse, I agree with you. It is romantic and elegant. Fluffy, no doubt. Wow, moneymaker, I like that. Pest-free, it is fairly pest-free with a couple notable exceptions. Glorious, whimsical, rose look-alike. Great, these are all excellent. Um, yeah, I like these fun little, fun little tools here. Okay, we're gonna keep on going here. So thanks for your input. Like I said, we'll have a couple of these little chats and uh, polls and just, just pay attention. So what is great about the Xianthus? Honestly, my favorite thing is how long it lasts. You know, it can last two or three weeks after you harvest it in the cooler. Admittedly, on that third week, once you pull it out of the cooler, it may not last that long. But if you're selling to an event florist who understands that, um, you have you know, this one florist I used to always work with. She didn't really care how old it was as long as it lasted through her wedding. So I would save colors to build up for a certain wedding of hers. Um, it holds really well out of water. If you've touched Lysianthus, you know it's kind of waxy. Um, it has a lot of moisture. It's a bit succulent. So it's really nice on those arches and uh, you know, boutonnieres flower crowns, if that's still happening. Um, it has the shape and texture of roses. You know, roses are sort of the classic cut flower. If you're around in the 90s, you remember how rose heavy uh, everything was in the Martha Stewart era. It was lovely. Um, roses are really difficult to produce in the US. They need a lot of uh, a lot of chemical intervention, usually take a lot of labor and they scratch you. Um, and they can often take a couple years to get established, unlike Mesianthus, which is an annual, so you can plant it in the spring and harvest it in the same season. They come in a wide range of colors, an ever-increasing range of colors and shapes and sizes, and they have a really long harvest window. You can pick them today, or you can go back next week and pick them. You might need to clean off a couple old blooms, but the new buds will keep opening so I love a flower, you know, in contrast to maybe a tulip or a lily that needs to be picked immediately. Lysianthus can last um, in the field or in your high tunnel for quite a long time. So here's the whole range of rose and Lysianthus. These are the first ones that uh, I started bringing, we sort of launched Farmer Bailey with this particular line of Lysianthus. Um, you know, kind of, kind of weird, not for everyone, but I, I love these odd colors. Um, and so do you. Here's one grown by a Flower Hill Farm in New York. I believe this is probably Roseanne. Too deep brown, but the colors and available varieties change. You know, in contrast to this sort of rigid, uh, these are quite roughly, they're, I don't know how you describe that shape. Um, you get things like chroma. Chroma is super round and ruffly and kind of like a ranunculus. Um, it does still have, you know, some strong rose vibes as well. We're gonna talk about all of these um, types of Lysianthus. But like I said, I really want you to start thinking like a plant. And the first thing I do when I start growing a new plant is to figure out where it comes from. Because it has to be, all flowers are derived from wildflowers. Either they're, they are wildflowers or they've been cultivated from a wild plant. Where do you think Lysianthus is from? Um, this was actually kind of surprising to me when I found out the answer. Um, it comes from a place with really hot and dry summers. Um, they have quite a bit of rain in the cooler part of the year. Okay, 43% of you got the correct answer of the plain states of the United States of America. Um, you might, you could very well think it they're from Japan because most of the breeding work has been done in Japan. Now, why don't we realize the potential of our own flowers and breed them into something? I don't know, but the Japanese saw Lysianthus and its qualities and they ran with it. Um, they haven't done all the breeding. The early breeding did start in Florida, um, but today most of the cutting edge breeding is happening in Japan. Um, very good, thanks for that. We'll have a couple more quizzes. This is what wild Lysianthus looks like. <clears throat> Wildflower.org is the Lady Bird Johnson Center for Wildflowers. Um, it's a really fun website, especially if you're looking to learn about Native American wildflowers. So you can see some similarity, especially in the buds to what we grow as the cultivated types, but uh, single petals, kind of a starry shape. We've come a long way from this form. <clears throat> 
So there's either three species of Lysianthus or there's one. It's actually not Lysianthus, it's Eustoma, but we still call it Lysianthus. Um, but Exaltatum or Russellianum or Grandiflorum, and they've all been hybridized um, into the, the cultivated forms we grow today. In nature, they grow in sandy soil, um, kind of loamy to sandy soil, often slightly alkaline, meaning they have a lot, you know, um, they're reaching uh, like a limestone bedrock in many cases. Um, they grow in moist meadows and open prairies, specifically on seasonal stream sides. So you'll see them, um, again, they have really hot, dry summer, but they have a cool, wet winter, and the roots are very deep. They can almost always access water. Okay, here's a list of states that you might find them. There's a lot of them. Um, there are actually some subspecies that go down into Florida and even the Caribbean, but uh, we'll save that for another day. Um, <clears throat> except that once they are established, they are very adaptable and heat tolerant. Um, the delicate stage is when there are plugs and seedlings, and we'll talk all about that today. To my knowledge, breeding really started with Lysianthus in the 80s, and in that really short period of time, not even 40 years, They've been turned into this very important international cut flower crop. Um, so I appreciate the breeders who have done all the work, and I'm excited to see what they come up with next. Okay. The modern Lysianthus types, they fall into a number of categories. We're going to just talk about them in general terms. There's some gray area in between each one, um, but here's sort of how the breeders try to think of these things. <clears throat> the doubles and semi-doubles, these were some of the first hybrids that came out. ABC and Echo have, and Mariachi have been around for quite a long time. Um, semi-double, you still often see the open center, but they've bred these in a whole range of colors and a whole range of bloom groups. This is probably the most accessible, available group of Lysianthus. Arena is a little bit newer from uh, Taki, excellent Lysianthus breeders from Japan. Um, Super Magic is another one you might see on occasion. The newer range of these um, will be the fringe types. The first available in the U.S. were Voyage. Um, that's one of the first varieties I helped bring into the U.S. Voyage is also known as Alyssa in Europe, but the way we grow them in America, they look a bit different. Um, at the end, we'll talk a little bit about Dutch production, but in America, when we're generally planting in the spring, harvesting in the fall, we're not doing so much with greenhouse forcing. Um, our flowers get really big and our stems get really tall and that really is where Voyage shows off. Um, Corelli, um, Voyage is from Sakata, Corelli is from Taiki. They have a new range called um, Corelli Sugoi, which is even more roughly into the middle. Corelli sometimes has an open center, but I think that's lovely. Celeb and Megalo are newer varieties from Sumika. We helped to get those into the US. I got to go to um, the great fortune of going to Japan in 2019 to look at Lysianthus trials. And for someone like me, that's just the most exciting event uh, I can imagine. Um, so anyway, this is the biggest focus of breeding today, these big luxurious flowers. They're a little bit more finicky. That's really only in relation to if you're growing them in the field and they're exposed to a lot of rain. Um, those big, you know, big fat flowers, they can take on a lot of rain. That's the only time I think you need to avoid growing these fringe types is if you have a really rainy place and you're trying to grow outside in the summer. Okay, Voyage to Blue on the left. Um, Six Duchess Farms and has this beautiful photo of Megalo Metallic Blue. Again, take the colors with a grain of salt. Obviously, neither of those are truly blue. Um, I believe these are both Celeb Series, Celeb Misty Pink or Celeb Queen on the left. And then... Um, one of the celeb whites or maybe megalo white, they're really difficult to uh, differentiate in a photo. Okay, the rose types is sort of um, the, the third wave. Um, and like I said, sometimes they have become so round that they look like Lizzie, um, like ranunculus. Um, the purpose of this breeding was to create a flower that resembled a rose both in color and shape, um, something that could be easily substituted in an arrangement. Um, Rosita, Chroma, and Arosa. Um, Rosita is from Sakata, I believe, Chroma from Taki, and Arosa from Sumika. Um, similar idea in the breeding. Um, I think these are the most underrated. The flowers are a bit smaller, but you get a lot of them per stem, so I encourage you to experiment with some of these rose types. Uh, I believe these are both Arosas. Sorry, I don't have the exact variety on everything. These are photos I took in Japan. 
And then the one on the left is somewhere between a rose type and a semi double, but that's that's okay. Um, and then I think we have chroma on the right. Okay. Oddly enough, the most recent ones are the single types. You saw that the um, old fashioned or the wildflowers are, they have a single row of petals, um, but we're going back to that because they look entirely different than the, um, you know, than these big fluffy uh, fringe types. Um, if you mix them together, they you wouldn't even realize that they're maybe the same flower. They have a looser, more wildflower look. Um, Falda has a ruffly edge to it, really lovely colors. Puccino is a new one um, in a range of kind of browns and plum colors. Um, Solo, also from Cicada, um, full range of really nice rigid flowers. They last a really long time. And Viviana is sort of like a wild type, but it does not uh, have pollen. So it'll last, they last three weeks in the vase. They're really quite incredible. I believe we have Viviana on the left. On the right, there is one of the new Puccino series. These are really quite small. Um, you know, a little bigger than a quarter, but you get a lot of them on a stem and they just look um, really nothing like what we've been seeing from Lysianthus. Have you seen this Bohemia Brown? Um, that's a Dutch trade name for this um, Puccino series. Okay, we have some Solo Yellow over here on the left. And then Viviana Pink on the right. Um, I'm a little over six feet, and these were much taller than I am. This is from Japan. They don't always get this tall, but if you really know what you're doing, they can get very tall. Um, it's a really whimsical, and I think these deserve more attention than they are currently getting. All right, so novelty types are, uh, well, kind of a mixed bag. Roseanne, obviously, it's novel because of its color. They haven't made a brown one that's really soft and ruffly yet. I'm sure they will. Um, Little Summer, they have a similar kind of rigid texture to Roseanne, but they come in oranges and salmon colors. Um, some really, really fun colors. Dublini are really, really small. They don't get that tall. You know, they're almost tall enough to cut for bouquets. These perfect little um, kind of spray rose size buds that are perfect for boutonnieres. When I used to grow Lysianthus or used to grow Dublini, um, I would just go and pick individual flowers. And I think from that one patch, I probably made a hundred boutonnieres that season and never even cut a stem. I would just go harvest one flower at a time. So if you are a boutonniere and a corsage maker, um, give Dublini a try. Um, Chateau Blue is a new color. It's really more of a French type, but the color is so odd. Um, let's take a look at it. I thought I would include that in novelty. It's kind of this beigey lavender. We're seeing more and more of these sort of in-between earthy weird colors from Japan. And I love it. I've always responded well to these things. Um, Roseanne, black pearl on the right, this kind of black inky color, which I also love. Um, so what type of Lysianthus are most appealing to you or your customers? All right, we have the results up now. Um, doubles and semi-doubles. Um, that's great. These have been the, the industry standards for a long time, and they're still going strong. We saw a lot in this category. Um, not surprisingly, fringe types are right behind. In a short period of time, they've become very popular. Um, I'm glad to see some of you are trying the rose types. Um, we need, I, I really do recommend them. Singles are definitely not the most popular, but there's a place for them with some people. And uh, all the novelties who can argue with those brown uh, if you had the audience for the brown ones, that's great. Some people say that their customers won't touch them because they look dead. Others really think that they're quite cool. Okie dokie. Get a lot of questions about bloom groups. You will notice that almost all of our Lysianthus will indicate a bloom group. I don't think we sell any zeros. I don't think the breeders are making any zeros. Um, mostly we sell ones, twos, threes, and some fours. So in basic terms, if you plant these all together, ones will bloom first, followed by two, followed by three, and then four. Um, that's fairly straightforward. All flowering plants, they have a vegetative stage and then they have a flowering stage. And there's some point when the cells decide, I'm gonna stop making leaves, I'm going to start making flowers. The mechanism in this, I'm trying to make this as clear as possible because it's a very complex, uh, relationship of a lot of different factors. Um, so every every variety has been bred to have a specific response so that you get your entire patch of 
voyage to light apricot blooming at the same time. You don't really want them, you know, initiating bud over a one month period. That might be nice in the garden, but for a commercial cut flower grower, that's not so great. <clears throat> it's a complex relationship between the stage of development of the plant, really how many leaves that plant has. Um, group ones will initiate bud when they have, I think, four or six leaves. Group twos, maybe eight leaves. Group three, 10 and four or 12 or more. Um, you don't need to worry about that. But if you plant a group zero, which has virtually, it goes immediately into flowering mode and you put it into hot sun in the middle of summer, it's gonna flower immediately and you're gonna get these puny little stems. Um, you'd be better off planting a three or four that has a delayed response. Um, also day length, temperature and light intensity all have a, um, a mechanism that controls the bloom group. My, my advice is to plant them all in the springtime. We'll talk about why. Um, plant some of each group so you get a bit of harvest, a bit of a you know, natural stagger in your harvest. But uh, unless you have a fully lit controlled greenhouse, it's really hard to time Lysianthus for a certain date. You get a lot of requests, people asking, how do I get Lysianthus in bloom on August 1st? And it's almost impossible unless you have just complete control of the environment. <clears throat> So Lysianthus are grown from seed, so you think you could just sow them and it would be easy, right? Um, well, any of us who have tried it, in fact, I'm doing it right now, and i that's one of the biggest ironies of moving um, away from America is that I no longer have access to the plugs, which were the very reason I started the plug business. Um, the ambient conditions in Madeira are pretty favorable, so I'm doing okay, but I would really much rather be ordering plugs. <laughs> um, they're really slow to get going. Um, and you got to keep them happy every day. They don't like any bumps in the road. They, uh, so they grow best when conditions are con controlled and consistent. I would say in the seedling stage, they grow best when everything is perfect. They don't like any disruptions. Um, if you do grow from seeds, um, follow the culture sheets precisely. We'll talk about those in one second. Plug facilities, the experts with all the equipment, they take 10 to 12 weeks to produce a plug. Um, you know, to get it up to transplant size. Home growers might need 12 or 16 weeks to produce a plug because you may not, you know, if you're growing under lights, you probably don't have uh, you know, exactly precise conditions. One of the best resources I've found um, are these tutorials from Sukata. Uh, there's a culture sheet and a tutorial, um, really in depth. The, uh, I've learned so much um, from Bob Croft at Sakata, he shared a lot of information with me. Um, we're dropping this into the chat so you can take a look at it. You can open it in a new window if you want, um, come back to it, or we will, we will also be emailing you these links if you don't want to, you know, deal with that link right now. No problem. We will send it to you. You will have it available to you. It is also on our website already. So, uh, you know, check out our culture guides on our website and we can link to a lot of these resources. You know, we didn't invent this stuff, we just learned how to do it, and we want to teach you how to do it. Okay, time for another poll here. Do you grow Lysianthus from plugs or from seed or a little bit of both? Just take a moment here and see what you have to say. All right, so here's our answers. 14% uh, only grow from seed. Good for you. I want you to grow from seed. It's a, it's a skill that can be learned, and uh, it's a skill that maybe could be lost if we don't keep doing it. 48% um, of you do only buy plugs. 31% uh, do a bit of each. I certainly know growers who are trying to get better at growing their own from seed, and they buy the plugs as a backup. We certainly get a lot of people who have thought, who tried from seed and haven't succeeded, so they call us in a panic looking for plugs, and we do our best to help. And some of you don't grow Lysianthus, and that's great. I'm glad you're here, and I hope you will give it a try because it's just the best flower. Oh. So as we just established, it takes 10 to 12 weeks to produce a plug for you. Thus, you need to give us at least 12 weeks to grow that for you for the date of your choosing. Um, ideally, you're going to give us 14 or 16 weeks. Ideally, you order in October or November, right when the ordering season opens. That generally gives you the best selection of dates 
uh, of ship dates and of varieties. Um, this year we started working with plug connection in California in addition to grow and sell. And that's giving us more capacity and the ability to ship from two coasts. Um, so we are our, our, our full availability held out for a really long time. Some dates are starting to disappear, but you know, at this point, um, I think what's 12 weeks from today, that's as soon as we could custom grow a tray of Lysianthus for you. Now, if you've ordered them and you aren't quite ready to plant them, I, I should say that um, all of our Lysianthus are big enough to go in the ground on arrival. Um, there's no harm in putting them in a 52, I'm sorry, a 72 or a 50 cell tray on arrival. Um, you should also keep some of these trays on hand in case your FedEx or UPS driver dumps your box upside down. Um, the plants might pop out of the tray. They're probably not dead. The shape of Lysianthus means it's really hard for it to break in transit. Some of the soil might have shifted off, but you can just put that in a larger cell on arrival. Um, I've done that many times and I've never lost a plant in doing that. Um, we sell Lysianthus in a 125, a 210, or a 285 tray. Um, in some countries, they grow them even smaller. I find that 285, 288 to be quite small enough. I wouldn't really want anything smaller than that myself. Um, the 125 is a nice, you know, nice, nice size tray or a nice size cell. Um, so this, these are some photos we took at Grow and Sell just to show you the process. If you are a seed grower, hopefully this will help you, um, you know, just sort of see uh, the process of a, a seed's life. But obviously the first step is to sow the seeds and then the seeds go into this uh, germination chamber. It's really foggy in there, it's 100% humidity. Um, the temperature is precisely controlled at the re recommended temperatures and they hold them in there until they start seeing them budge. That could be a good 10 days on the Zianthus. Um, Lysianthus is usually pelleted and that pellet starts to dissolve and slowly but surely you start to see them. Now this is about the stage that mine are in in my driveway right now. Um, you can easily miss that they're even there and that's part of what's tricky about them. You might think you don't need to water or pay attention but actually those tiny leaves are forming. So this is probably four or five maybe even six weeks after sowing. And here we have some on the left that are about ready to ship and some that are maybe, you know, three or four weeks behind. Um, the plug growers, I'm just amazed at how they can get every plant looking the same um, and ready on the same date. They're really, we owe a lot of gratitude to these plug facilities that produce for us. <clears throat> um, here's an inside shot of uh, grow and sell, they have boom irrigation, you know, really precise lighting and heating control that responds to the actual environment in that space. I have a whole team of people who carefully pack each tray into boxes and get them out the door. Um, do go and watch that video. We'll send you a link to it. It's on the website already. Um, it's really fun to see the whole process. We did a tour at Grow and Sell years ago, and people were just amazed. They had no idea what goes into producing that plant and getting it to your doorstep in good shape. But we talked about ordering and when you need to order, but when do you actually want these plants? This is kind of the first part of the equation. So I will say that week 12 is our busiest ship week. That works for a lot of people in the United States. Um, some of you further south want them a lot earlier. Some of you further north might want them later or you might want to get them around then and transplant them into a larger cell. So this is a photo from our farm in Vermont. We often got them early and put them in a, I believe these are 50 cell trays, maybe 72s. Regardless, we would get them about three weeks early and just get a little size on them before it was warm enough to transplant into our tunnels. Generally inside a tunnel four or four to eight weeks before your last frost, it will be warm enough in the tunnel to consider planting. In the field, I would wait until two or three weeks. The plants are gonna need two or three weeks of cool soil before you start experiencing the heat of summer. Cool, I refer to cool as anything 55 degrees Fahrenheit or cooler. Um, there's, a, there's a wiggle room in here. Um, your own experience will guide you. You don't want to be planting Lysianthus into 100, into 100 degree soil. That's when you start seeing rosetting, um, which we will talk about later. If you are planting later in the north, um, you might think, oh, I want something that will mature quickly. I'm gonna go for ones and twos. Really, if you're planting towards those longer days of summer, threes and fours are a bit better because they have a slightly delayed flowering response. It gives that plant time to bulk up a little bit before it sends up its first flower. 
Speaking of cool soil, one thing you don't really need to worry about as much as you probably do worry about it is lysianthus getting cold. Now you don't want to freeze your tray of lysianthus. The roots in a tray are very exposed to the temperature. The roots are less frost hardy than the leaves are. So you don't want to freeze the roots. But once they're in the ground, in the soil, it's okay if they get a frost. Um, the soil holds a lot of, um, retains a lot of heat from the daylight. You know, if your soil, you go out on a frosty morning, but the soil has not fully frozen. So that protects the roots. The leaves are really quite, quite tolerant. Um, kind of curious what your experience is. Feel free to pop it in the chat. You know, have you, do you plant out when it's still frosty? Have you lost things to freezing? How cold did it get? Um, in my experience, down to about 20 is okay. Um, you know, I would put a bit of frost cover on there just as a precaution. But you're better off planting on the cooler side of the season than planting into the warmer part of late spring. We very rarely have plants freeze in transit. Um, both all of our facilities watch the shipping. Uh, you know, they watch the weather religiously to make sure they're not sending something into a danger zone. Every now and then something gets delayed and we have had it, you know, a very small percent of freezing um, happen. But generally, even if it's 15, 20 degrees outside, you don't really need to worry about your plants. They're insulated, they're gonna get there okay. The general recommendation for transplanting and spacing is to put eight plants per square foot. Now, if you're using the Hortonova net, netting, that's about a six by six square, that breaks down to two plants per square. Um, I do recommend that you use support netting. Lysianth Lysianthus gets very uh, top heavy when it is in flower. I always liked two layers. Um, I know some people say you don't need support netting with Lysianthus, and I question that from my own experience. When you have a four foot plant with big heavy flowers and it's packed really closely, it wants to fall over. And that's really heartbreaking when you have all that money and time invested, they finally flower and then they flop. And uh, sometimes it's hard to salvage them. After transplanting, you will want to overhead water. That would be with a sprinkler or with a hose. Now, you can see the drip tape there. Depending on your soil type, you know, if you have sandy soil, the drip could be happening here and the plug is here and it's just not connecting. If you have a heavier soil and, you know, a clay-based soil or more organic matter, the water will travel a little bit side to side, but I really, really, really encourage you to overhead water all plugs for at least the first couple of weeks until you start seeing some growth. If you see some growth, you know that the roots have come out of the plug a bit and they're finding their way into the little pockets of water trapped in your soil. But until then, you only have this much, just a tiny little bit of uh, access to water for that plant. Do not allow them to dry out on this stage. Um, this is not a time to test how rugged they are or how drought tolerant. Later in the season, yes. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit more about pinching. It will encourage branching but will produce shorter stems. Um, like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about that. If you are going to pitch a lysianthus, you can make them plant them a little wider because you're going to get some, as you get, you know, four stems per plant, they need a little more space. Like I said, two layers of support netting is what I prefer. You may disagree and that is fine. A lot of this is about your own personal preference and success in your situation. Um, in Japan in 2019, I saw this technique for the first time. This is where you leave um, a strip down the middle of your bed. This improves airflow. Um, it will reduce diseases. We'll talk about diseases um, in just a moment. Um, Fusarium being the best one. Any fungal disease is uh, mitigated by good airflow. So this is a really nice way to uh, consider getting air in, in between your plants. Um, on the right is a more traditional approach. This is how we used to grow them until I saw how they did them in Japan. And then I started leaving that gap in the middle. Um, <clears throat> fusarium travels beneath the soil. So if you get fusarium into the plant, the plant, the plant. In this scenario, it can't jump over to the other side very easily. Um, I would even, in between varieties, leave a little gap in case it started spreading like wildfire. There would be these almost fire breaks in the row that would stop fusarium from um, proceeding unchecked. You may occasionally see a plant that looks like this, most likely if you have exposed a young plant to hot soil. Um, this condition is called rosetting. It's a stress response from the plant. 
it's the plant thinks it doesn't have time to get its roots out and flower that year, it's going to wait. So this plant will, it will possibly bloom the next year if you can keep it alive that long. But this is just the plant saying, hold on, we're not flowering now. Let's try next year. Maybe that'll work. But this isn't going to work. And it's really all related to heat stress. So plant early, plant into cool soil, preferably below 55 degrees. If you live in a hot place, you have trouble maintaining cool soil, um, silver or white mulch over your plants would work. And put some row cover on them, um, shade them a little bit to really keep the heat, the sun off the soil. That's uh, the, the direct rays of the sun aren't really the problem, it's the hot soil. Okay, we talked, we're going to talk about diseases now. There's a handful of them. Um, what's the big one that we want to watch out for? What's What's the dreaded one? We'll pop this little quiz up here. 67% of you have probably grown Lysianthus before because you said Fusarium and maybe you've encountered it before. We're going to talk a lot about Fusarium in the next little segment here. Botrytis actually does happen. Um, Aster yellows can happen. It's not super common, but it does happen. Uh, probably I've seen a bit of mildew on Lysianthus. Um, and I haven't seen boron deficiency, but I bet. If you didn't have enough boron, it would show up. And it's a really clever at showing you when they are deficient. All right, so those of you who guessed Fusarium may have seen something like this. Now, it's seemingly everything is going well. Why is that one plant dead in the middle? Is it not getting enough water? The answer is it probably has Fusarium. Fusarium atta attacks the roots, and thus the plant can't consume water or nutrients anymore and the top growth just dies. Oftentimes the first symptoms of Fusarium are a bit of wilting and then you think, oh, I need to water more. So you increase the water and that actually kind of makes things worse because fungi really spread through moist soil um, and just a humid environment is what fungi are looking for to spread. <clears throat> there are other root rot fungi, um, but Fusarium is the biggest one. I encourage you to find out where you can get your plants tested. Generally, it is your state land grant university. Speak with your county extension agent. They can help connect you. Um, it's often free or cheap to get your plants tested. But once I got my first fusarium case tested, I knew for sure exactly what fusarium looks like in my area. It is ubiquitous. You will find it in most places in the country. It can, you know, they do send out spores that can travel a very long distance on the wind. So you may not have seen it one year and you might see it the next. Um, it's just kind of unavoidable. You will come across it at some point. You can pre-treat with fungicides or biofungicides. We'll talk about that in a moment. Some people are using soil steaming. We'll talk about that. Actually, we won't talk about that. Um, soil steaming requires very specific, very big, heavy, expensive equipment and a lot of petroleum to generate the steam to steam the soil. The purpose there is to kill the pathogenic cells or spores in your soil before you plant. Um, it's a cool concept, but it's really out of reach for a lot of people, unless you're growing on a really serious, large scale. And yes, yeah, sad news. You see your is everywhere. Um, there are a couple other diseases and pests. Botrytis will affect the petals on your flowers. So you've had a long, rainy, damp period. Um, you'll start seeing spotting that's probably botrytis. It could be another similar fungi called cladosporium. Again, your state plant pathologist will help you with this. Um, tip burn um, is a result of a calcium deficiency and or prolonged high humidity. We saw this last summer on the East Coast when you all had so much rain and cloudy days for such a long period of time. <clears throat> when the air is so, when the air is saturated, the plant can't transpire. Think about if you're in a really humid place, you can't sweat, <clears throat> then you feel it. Um, <clears throat> when the plant can't transpire, it can't bring water from the roots and calcium gets locked up in different parts of the plant. It's not reaching the tip. So it's all related. If you see something like this photo on the right, um, this is a calcium deficiency most likely. Um, a customer sent me this photo last year. We have not credited them. We don't want them to feel ashamed. There's nothing to be ashamed of. I think this is purely the result of the conditions that you experienced in your environment last season. Um, hopefully it won't be the same next year. Thrips are the primary insect pest. Um, I won't go into all, there's lots written about thrips control. Um, but they have little scraping mouth parts. They go inside the bud before it even opens. You'll see these kind of streaking 
um, damaged flowers. The best time to treat thrips is before you have them. So take a moment to educate yourself on thrips. Okay, back to Fusarium. Here's some more just gnarly photos of what it looks like. Um, really sudden wilting and death of the plant at any time. You need to remove it as soon as you see it. Don't wait to see if it will recover. It will not recover. The longer you leave them in that place, the more they will spread to their neighboring plants. Don't put them in your compost. You don't want those, uh, those fungal spores. You know, they, uh, they don't need any help getting established. Another little tip, uh, tip that I learned the hard way, I put my plugs, they arrived and I unpacked them and just laid them in the driveway while I was getting things unpacked. And then I started to see individual plants die because I had exposed the plug to fusarium through the root. So from that point forward, I only put my plug trays on a clean bench on arrival. That really helped. Now you might hear us talk about um, root shield. Root shield is a biofungicide. This is a bacterial product that attaches to the roots of the plant. It grows with the roots of the plant, um, protecting the plant for its entire life. There's other products that do a similar thing, but they're different fungi or bacteria. Um, Prefence is one that activates a similar product. I'm going to see you put a link here to how you treat your plugs with these products. The current recommendations are to dip them with one product, perhaps root shield on arrival, and then maybe the next day or two days later, when you're ready to finally get them in the ground, dip them in Actinovate or an alternate product. I used to mix them all together. I would mix some sea, uh, liquid seaweed, liquid fish food at the same time. The new recommendation is to do one and then do the other. They can live together um, once they've attached to the root, but maybe they get better attachment if you do them one at a time. Again, I'm not a plant pathologist. I'm not licensed to um, make any of these recommendations, particularly the chemical ones. There is a fungicide, um, one of the lower toxicity fungicides called Heritage. That's the trade name, Azoxystrobin is the um, chemical name. I have used this a bit and I have gotten some really good results there as well. So I know some of us are organic, some are not. I wanna just give you some information on both options. There have been some recent studies using um, certain kinds of mustard as cover crops. There's one called Caliente, I'm assuming it's kind of hot. Um, you know, if you've ever had like wasabi or mustard in your nose, you know, how, uh, how potent that mustard gas is, this actual mustard gas. So the idea here, we, you plant on your field, you would till it under, um, and then as that material breaks down, it's going to almost chemically fumigate the soil, but with organic chemicals. So we posted a link to that as well. Again, we will send you these links after the presentation. So where should you grow Lysiandus? Uh, in an unheated tunnel, in a field, in a heated, animated greenhouse. Um, my favorite is going to be tunnel for most people, specifically because you can keep the water off. You can manage your moisture better. Um, you know, that will reduce in, re result in lower fusarium, lower botrytis. You can start your season earlier. Stems are going to be taller. There's just a lot of reasons why uh, Lysianth has always got priority in all of our tunnels. The field will work. You may have a little bit of trouble with the big fringy doubly types. Um, if you have a really dry summer, you probably won't have trouble. You know, in Vermont, we could get a lot of rain in the summertime, so I never succeeded at growing the fringe types in the field. Um, don't be afraid to try them in the field. The singles and the semi-doubles, and even the roseanne, the novelty types, they can be very happy in the field. So it's a little bit of trial and error. You need to learn your location and learn how Lysianthus responds in your location. Um, if you have a heated automated greenhouse, um, you, you, the world opens up to you. You, know, you can probably even schedule six or more harvests of Lysianthus from the same space every year. Um, most of our customers don't have these facilities yet, but I see more people moving into this kind of production. All right, we get a lot of questions on water and fertilizer. Obviously, we've talked about them being from near stream beds. Um, they're seasonally moist, but they can always find water down below. So especially in the early part of the season, you need to keep them well watered. Um, later on, starting flowering time, they're more forgiving, provided there is water somewhere down there. In terms of fertilizer, you must test your soil. It's really recommended. 
Um, it's impossible to tell you what to fertilize with if you have not done a soil test. Um, you know, you're, when you fertilize, you're trying to make up what's lacking in the soil or lacking in your water. And there is a relationship between the soil and the water. And you won't understand this until you do a soil test. You know, it never hurts to add organic matter, but beyond that, um, do a, get a good test done by your state university and follow the recommendations. A soil test will nearly always come with a recommendation. We've talked about the practice of pinching your lysianthus. Um, I never did. I don't think, I really like getting these three, four foot stems because I had really high end florists that would give me a good price for them. If you've seen the Japanese lysianthus, um, in the flower markets, you might be paying wholesale seven or eight dollars for one stem of lysianthus. Those are the kind of prices I want, and those are the kind of prices I want for you. You wouldn't, that plant was not pinched. That was one, one plug that was grown to perfection and then cut at just the right time. Cornell, I think in 2015, did discover if they pinched plants and spaced them further apart, the per plant harvest went up. Um, you know, they might be a shorter size, but they were good for market bouquets, or if you had a customer that did not require premium quality. An interesting approach would be to pinch some of your plants and to not pinch others. This will naturally stagger them by a week to 10 days. You get two harvest windows, but uh, always play around, you know, just pinch 10 plants and see if you like the result. Again, and that's one way you can, ex you can extend your harvest. Succession planting helps a bit but you need to really make sure that you have planted into the cool part of the year um, to ensure success. Also planting some in your tunnel and some in your field will really help out. The tunnel will grow faster because it is warmer on those first cool spring nights. The field plants will be fine, but they'll just take a little longer to get going. So those are, those are some tips for extending your harvest. Um, I'm curious to know if you all pinch your lysianthus. Got another little poll here. Let me know what you do. All right, let's take a look at the results here. 58 do 58% do not pinch. Um 4% say they do pinch reliably. Some pinch some and not others, maybe to get you know a variation in harvest time. And we do still have people with us who don't grow Lysianthus. So when you start, you may as well give it a try. Um, thanks for your input there. All right, there is this advanced technique. Um, of bud removal that, sorry, let me get rid of the, <clears throat> the Japanese, I first saw it in Japan a few years ago. This might be a bit hard to describe. So if you've grown lysianthus, you know that it always has one flower that opens before the rest. Now you can pinch that flower out, um, even when it's just in the bud form, to redirect the resources into the buds that come next. So if one flower that comes in, then you'll probably get about four on the next level, on the next tier of blooms. And the best way to, you know, keep to get larger flowers is to remove some of the buds. So you remove that first bud. You might select three or four blooms, buds that are all about the same stage, maybe a few above that level. And then you actually pinch out the tips. So you're just allowing the plant to develop those four flowers and then three buds. And that's how the Japanese get these beautiful, big, fat buds. When you see the Japanese cut flower, the Xianthus, they sell them in five stem bunches because that's more than enough flowers. Um, in general, if you're not pinching, you're going to get a few a few big flowers, and you you know I do like the looks of the little buds. But if you're going for a really big fat premium flower, um, play around with removing buds. You can email me for more information. I have some videos that we weren't able to embed here, but it's really fascinating the the quality that you can achieve by just uh, you know adding that extra set that little extra bit of labor. So if you would, if you tried removing buds, or if you think you'd like to try it, um, you can comment in the chat about that. It's not widely done. I don't know anyone who does it on their entire crop in the U.S. Um, I, uh, I've, I've, I used to do it on a few beds, but it gets pretty, pretty tiring. It's kind of like disbudding chrysanthemums. It's a, it's a bit of a nuisance. Okay, so how do you achieve superior quality? Obviously, quality sells. I think we have unlimited space in the American market for an unlimited number of growers if they grow good quality. We need to be competing with the quality that comes in from overseas, which is really, really good. So really being on top of your watering, making sure you have good, you know, good 
um, irrigation that it runs at the right time, overhead watering at the beginning, in addition to drip irrigation as the plants are established, consistent and adequate fertilization for your unique soil. So again, fertilization must be based on your soil tests. It's essential. Um, getting your planting time is probably what, you know, is a very important thing that you should do. Um, really learn what, keep an eye on your calendar, keep notes. Um, obviously the environment is changing, frost dates are moving back and forward, we're getting weird arctic blasts when we used to have daffodils blooming. Um, just keep an eye on what worked this year, and if it worked next year, try the same thing. Um, try to get the rain off your plants, not always possible. Um, and increasing quality is the fastest way to increase profits. When I delivered a premium product to one of my florists, they never, they never questioned the price. Um, you know, go to a really high-end floral wholesaler sometime and look at the product and look at the price and see if you can't match it. All right. Again, for harvest and post-harvest, we want to remove the first bud or flower. Um, you can wait until it opens if you want to sell that or use that little little flower uh, on its own. Early removal of that bud will you know, redirect resources to the later flowers. Um, like I said, you can begin harvesting when that second tier of flowers are, are open. It's tempting to want to cut it when that first flower opens, but you're really just throwing away all those other buds. Some will open, but most will not. <clears throat> um, there's no need to harvest today if you don't have a customer today. Lysianthus is great for, you can hold it in the field for weeks. And a simple holding solution, something like a chrysal number two, that's really all the post-harvest care you need. They're not that fussy. Even pure water, they're gonna last 10 days after cutting. Um, I like using flower foods because they keep the bacterial levels down in your water. Okay, Lysianthus is technically a perennial. In the wild, they will sometimes live for a couple of years. Um, so if you want, if you're in a place with a long summer and you have a lot of warmth in the late season, cut them right down to the ground at harvest time, and then you may see a second flush. Some people even get a third flush. Generally, it's not um, as good a quality as the first flush, but that's okay. I would much rather have a shorter stem that I can make some money on than not have those stems at all. There are people who try to overwinter the Lysianthus for a couple of years. Um, I was never able to do this in Vermont, but you might want to consider some straw or mulch or row cover, something like that, that can help. Um, generally, zone seven and warmer would be where you would have better luck at doing that. Generally, that's going to be in a high tunnel. So I won't spend too much time talking about this. Um, hopefully you do get that second flush. It's a real bonus if that happens. All right, uh, I'm just gonna stop sharing here for a moment. What, what, what have you learned so far? What did you not know coming into this meeting that you now know? Okay, I get a lot of questions, not a lot. A few times a year, I'll have a, a long chat with someone about the possibility of getting organic Lysianthus plugs. And it's kind of complicated, but I wanna talk about it because there's, a, there's reasons we don't see this yet. <clears throat> I will say we now are working with Plug Connection. They do have a certified organic facility, but the problem is the seed. The majority of the seed is produced in Japan. The seeds generally arrive in the US already pelleted. Because they're very tiny, the pellet helps the sewing machines be able to pick up the seed more easily. <clears throat> the pellet is a proprietary technology. They don't have to declare everything that is in the pellet. There's some certifier that will have to look at it and make sure it is chemicals that are allowed in a certain country, but they don't have to tell us everything, thus it can't be certified. They may not have chemicals that would disqualify the plant, but we just don't know what is in the pellet. So in theory, we could get raw seed before they're pelleted, but we would probably need closer to 50 to 100,000 seeds per variety. We're missing a zero there. Um, for them to disrupt their, their line, the production line to pull out that seed to be able to count it at that small size. It's just uh, you're asking a lot of that seed producer. That seed would then need to be pelleted with an OMRI approved pellet. Again, those there are organic pellet producers. They also don't tell you what's in the pellet, but there are some that are that are approved for organic pelleting. 
And if you could do all that, there's still very few organic plug producers in the US. Like I said, um, the plug connection is one of them. One of the things that worldwide demand um, is really up for Lysianthus. There's a lot of people growing Lysianthus all over the world. And it's often hard for us to get even enough of the hot varieties to sell in a conventional way. Um, so they really don't have a motivation to take seed out of that production stream in order to make an organic plug. Um, so really all comes down to economics. If you are a large organic grower who needs 50 to 100,000 of a certain plug, talk to me, we wanna figure this out. It would be really great if our certified organic growers could also be getting Lysianthus. Um, we're not dismissive of you at all. It's just a lot to figure out. And we've been talking about it for years and we still haven't figured out how to make it all line up. Speaking of Lysianthus producers, uh, last November, Felicia and I had the fortune, or I guess a year ago, of going to the Netherlands for a big trade show. We visited Luc Lysianthus in the Netherlands. Um, we were, our host from Sakata Seeds got us in the door there. These people produce 60 million stems per year from one facility. Um, this place is huge. It is hot. It's 80 some degrees in there. They have supplemental lighting. They have robots that plant the plugs, the conveyor belts that move these flowers all over the place. Um, really, really impressive. I will say, I think our quality in the America is a little bit better. You see these, uh, they have a lot of small flowers and a lot of buds. That's how the Dutch grow them. So they can grow them quickly in that style. If you grow them a little more slowly, a little bit more seasonally, the flowers do get bigger. So I think we should be asking for higher prices than we are seeing, um, especially compared to the Dutch imports. We have a lot of notions about what imported flowers are and aren't and where they're coming from. And we, I think, sometimes like to make the case that they're really horrible. These are great people growing beautiful flowers, but we can grow even better flowers closer to home. So let's do that. I often get asked, what is your secret? What's the best kept secret to succeeding with Lysianthus? Um, this is from our customer, Two Hills Farm in Maryland, sent us this photo. All right, I'm gonna let you in on the biggest secret, everyone. Our biggest secret is that we have no secrets. There are no shortcuts to succeeding with Lysianthus. Be in charge of your own destiny and your own education and read everything you can get your hands on and think like a plant. Think, learn what the plant needs, learn how you can give the plant what it needs and you will succeed. That's the only secret. Um, there's no quick, easy, catch all 100% solution. Um, I see we have a few questions and yeah, we've got a little bit of time left. Um, let me just see if I can answer a few of these. I'm gonna turn off my share here for one moment. Okay, somebody, Marta is asking, if you collect seeds, will the seedlings produce the same flower type? Um, I think if you only have fringy doubles, they probably will all be fringy doubles in the next generation. Um, most of these are F1 hybrids, so you have one parent over here, one parent here, they're crossed, and then the seed, the seeds that we purchase and grow for you um, will result in a uniform color. You probably get a lot of variation, but if you save seeds, um, you might get something very lovely as well. Um, this is all plant breeding. You know, you can control which parents you use. I would love to see more people breeding Lysianthus in the United States. Um, it's just not very commonly done. Um, Sue asks, is the algae growing in with seeds and small plants hurt? Um, that is, it doesn't actually hurt anything. What happens sometimes is that that algae will make kind of a skin on top of the plug and then it's hard to water it. Um, since Lysianthus is so slow growing, it needs a lot of water in the early stages you do see some algae forming on the top of trays fairly often. Um, there are some products, even some like peroxide based organic products you can spray to keep that algae at bay, but uh, it won't hurt the plants, but it might in interfere with your success. That makes sense. Uh, Jerry asks, how do you get the soil so compact so that the plugs are easy to pull out without the soil breaking apart? And how do you make them root so well, which makes them easy to pull out from the tray? The plug growers are really looking more at the roots than they are looking at the top of the plant. 
that's kind of how they decide when the plug is finished and when it's ready to ship. They want it right on the verge of being a little, not root bound, but getting close because that's when the plug is held together. You get that kind of growth when the conditions are perfect and consistent every day. And that's part of why it's often difficult for people to do that under lights or in their own home because conditions are changing all the time. Um, I will say plug connection uses what they call a stabilized media. Um, there's a bit of almost a bit of glue that holds the soil together. So that even if the plug is not super rooted, um, they hold together quite easily. But generally, it's just the roots that are holding that soil together. Um, and that's just the sign of a well grown plug. Um, thrips. A question about thrips. Any beneficials that I've had success with? Um, yes, there is a predatory mite that you need to put out quite frequently, but it's really quite affordable. <clears throat> Something cucumerous is the one that I used to always use. There's one called Swirskii, which needs a warmer condition. Um, I'm blanking on the name of a biological control company at the moment. And Arbico's on the West Coast, I've ordered from them. Um, IPM Labs in New York State is the one that I would always use. Um, they would really great advice on um, beneficials that would help with you know, certain pests. But like I said, you need to have these, you need to have your, your thrips plan in place before you see the thrips. They are so tiny. Um, it's really hard to get rid of them, even with really harsh chemicals, which I, which I don't recommend for you. Um, beneficials are a great way to go, but you need to plan ahead and get those beneficials in place before you even have buds on your plants. Um, there's planting groups one and two types. Lysianthus allow for a better likelihood of a second flush. I think it does. These are the ones that will flower first, they'll flower early. Um, that gives them more time to reflower. Um, if you don't just bud with the second and third tier buds not completely open, usually you cut Lysianthus with some open flowers and then the, whatever rung is above those will open mostly. They might be a little lighter color. Um, the, third, the third rung after cutting, they generally don't have enough nutrients um, to develop those buds. This is another time when flower food does come in handy. Flower food is largely sugar. Sugar feeds those buds and helps them to continue to develop and to open. What resources are available to help us determine how much we should be charging for our disease as well as other flowers? That's a great question, and it's always been a difficult question. Um, <clears throat> the ASCFG, the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, if you're not a member, I very much recommend it. Um, they have tried to compile this data sometime. The question of uh, quality is, for me, it's really a question of quality. Now, if you've grown a really poor example of a lysianthus that's 10 inches tall, and you have someone else who's grown this beautiful four foot lysianthus with 10 inch flowers on it, should they be getting the same price? So everything is sold, you know, kind of by stem in America, but we're really not considering the quality. This is where an auction system um, really comes in handy. In Holland, all flowers are sold through a Dutch auction. The buyers know the quality of each grower. They go there and look at it in particular, and the high quality gets the highest price. This is how they sell flowers in Japan. This is how they sell flowers in Brazil. This is how they sell flowers uh, even in Canada. But for some reason, we've never developed an auction system in the US. Um, I don't think I'm going to get around to that, but it's something I've thought a lot about. How could we do this? Um, because that will only encourage the increase of quality. So I'm going to think about this. I'm going to talk with my friend Lenny Larkin, who, like I said, we're going to give away one of her books. She's really focused on the business of flower farming. I know she does a lot of work on pricing. I would definitely pick up her new book if you're not the lucky winner today. Um, <clears throat> but she's going to be writing some resources for us. So we're going to add pricing to that discussion. That's a really great, really great question. <clears throat> All right, we'll take one more question here. Um, what type of shade cloth do you use? In Vermont, I was growing my lysianthus in my sweet pea tunnels. Their sweet peas were our king, our queens, our everything. We would use a silver lysianthus, or sorry, a silver shade cloth because it reflected a lot of the heat. Um, in my mind, if you're trying to cool off a structure, why would you put black cloth on it that's going to heat up that surface? Um, the shade is obviously cooler, but you're also heating at the same time as you're shading. So I used the Illum Illuminate is what I, I used. It's a little more expensive, but it's very lightweight, very easy to put on. 
Um, I personally sourced mine from Nolts in Pennsylvania, but uh, any agricultural greenhouse supply company probably has this silver shade cloth. All right, y'all, we're gonna finish up here in just a second. Um, like I said, please send us your questions. We're always available to you. We have a team working almost around the clock now, and uh, we're here to help. And with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off. Thanks for your time. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we're gonna ask you for some feedback. If you have ideas for other presentations you would like to see, um, I really love this kind of education. The flower community has been so generous in sharing with me that I view it as my duty to share with you. All right. Thank you.